Salut les rebelles intelligents J'ai profité de ma venue à Las Vegas pour rencontrer un blogueur qui m'a beaucoup inspiré et d'ailleurs que je cite plusieurs fois dans « Tout le monde n'a pas eu la chance de rater ses études ». Ce blogueur, c'est Steve Pavlina qui vit ici. Donc on s'est rencontré dans un café et je trouvais que notre discussion était tellement intéressante que je me suis dit il faudrait que je la partage avec vous. Donc j'ai fait euh, l'interview vraiment à l'arrache avec le matériel du bord. Vous allez voir, c'est pas super bien cadré, mais euh, honnêtement, focalisez-vous sur ce que Steve partage. Vous allez voir, c'est vraiment, vraiment super intéressant. Salut Steve, ça va Bonjour. <rire> donc Steve est américain, il a appris un peu le français, mais pas suffisamment pour faire une interview en français, donc on va faire le reste en anglais. It will be stable. Donc surtout, activez bien les sous-titres en cliquant sur le bouton qui va bien, parce que sinon, ben, vous devez avoir un super anglais pour comprendre le reste de l'interview. So Steve, I'm really happy to uh, do this interview with you now. Because, I mean, your blog inspired me back in the days, like in 2007, to start my, my, my online career as a blogger. And so you have, I will do like quickly your introductions for people that, that don't know you. you. You have like a very popular website about personal development called Steve Pavina. So it's your name, stevepavina.com. And it's like full of uh, very deep articles about a lot of subjects, like, you know, You, you, I don't know if you were the one who invented the 30 day challenge, for example, or you're the one who like make it popular. The 30 day trial? Yeah, as far as I know, I was the one who popularized it. But it was, wow. it was a technique I borrowed from software development because I used to be a computer game developer. Yeah. So that was very common to use 30 day trials with you know, software. Um, you download a demo, you get to use it for 30 days, and then you have to buy it or register it. So, you know, I thought that's a great way to get people to buy software. It's also a great way to install or test new habits. Yeah, and it was genius to think, just think about, hey, why not do like a, a, a trial, like software trial, but to anything in life. And so you, you wrote about that, you wrote about like uh, your experiment with a polyphasic sleep, very interesting. So like how to sleep two to uh, four, four hours uh, uh, yeah, every like, day without like being tired. Every day. Yeah. yeah, that was a crazy Because you did the Uberman, but there is also the everyday, uh, mm -hmm. every man, every man, every man yeah. which is like a little It's a little easier because you get a longer nap at night, yeah. like so maybe three hours four, yeah. at night. Yeah. And, and so the goal is like you sleep like two to four hours, so two hours in case of uh, Uberman, and you like you don't you're not tired at all. It's like in the beginning you are. It's terrible sleep deprivation for the first week or two, and then if your body can adapt, and I don't think everyone can adapt to it. I think it has to do with something genetic because a lot of people that try it, no matter how disciplined they are, they just can't seem to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas other people are able to adapt to it a little bit more easily. Um, Then, you know, then it becomes a lot easier. But it's pretty strict, because you have to take a 20-minute nap, at least the way I did it, a 20-minute nap every four hours continuously around you the cannot, You cannot be late. You can, you can a little bit. I could slide it to maybe five hours or six hours, but you can't skip a nap. That's really bad, because you'll be paying for it for the, for the next 24 hours. You'll just be very sleep-deprived and really mm -hmm. tired. Uh, but I did that for five and a half months, and looking back, I almost can't believe I did it that long. And the main reason I stopped, though, is that it, it makes a mess of your social life. Because <laughs> yeah. you have to live your life in three-hour and 40-minute chunks. So, you know, I couldn't travel much during that time. I wasn't really into traveling back then a lot, but it's, yeah, it's really you, hard to so break everything. You're so out of sync everything. with everyone else. You're out of sync with all of reality, but it, I'm glad I did it for a while because it was really fascinating. It mm -hmm. uh, it's, gives you a whole different perspective on time because we're used to living our life one day at a time in these discrete, finite chunks. And when you're awake seemingly continuously because these 20 minute naps are just small little breaks out of your day it's not like you're really going for a big rest and resetting a new day it's like it's one day all the way continuously so from october when i started in to april when i finished it was like one day all the way through it seemed like it's like the sun comes up the sun goes down the sun comes up the sun goes down you're the constant now it's not like the world is turning without you you're there to see everything happening And you see people go to bed, and then people get up in the morning, and you know, the, wow. the city shuts down, and the city wakes up again. So this this city so doesn't shut down that much, though, because we're in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, right? Las Vegas, no. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's like watching like a movie of everyone, like mm -hmm. in acceleration. Yeah, and, uh, it's it, a little it, surreal. It gives you like yeah, different perspective on time. Uh -huh. But it it makes you feel much more disconnected from everyone mm -hmm. because you you know, for one, you're spending a lot of time alone each night, uh, unless you make nighttime friends and daytime friends or something like that. <laughs> But it, 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 can get, it can get almost um, just too much. It's overwhelming or exhausting. Just all the input you're taking in every 24 hours. Yeah. 
but so you, you couldn't like create a community of people who were like you it's, it's too rare you could in fact the people I know who've succeeded with this the long longest yeah. they yeah. created a community like five or eight people got together and they did this as a group and that gives them a lot more stability because now they can hang out with each other while they're doing this mm. I was doing it by myself which I think was a lot harder and it's mm. it gets a bit lonelier <laughs> at night because all your friends are asleep but, yeah you know so it acts for four months and a half five months and a half five, yeah five and a half for months. sleeping two hours a day man Wow, so that's the kind of stuff you write about on your blog, like so many, so many articles, how many articles do you have, like more than 1,000? I think about 1,300. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay, so, and we are not talking about like short articles, I mean, go to the site and, and see it. So, um, I'm curious about these uh, 30 days uh, challenges you did. What is the most life-changing 30 days challenge you did in your life? That's an easy one. Okay. Um, it was actually the very first one I did, yeah. um, which I did, um, this was long before I started blogging, before I did anything in business. When I was back at university, um, between two semesters in, in college, I got the idea that I wanted to try going vegetarian for 30 days. Mm. And I, I had a friend who was Indian and he would always eat vegetarian. You know? So we'd go out for pizza and he would eat cheese pizza and I would have pepperoni pizza. And I always thought it was interesting and he seemed very, um, he seemed very sharp mentally. And I, I thought he was like one of my smartest friends. And I thought, interesting, I wonder if there's a connection there. Um, so I, did, you know, I decided at some point in my life, I just wanted to try being vegetarian. I had no interest in going vegetarian, but I just wanted to try it. And I thought, what if I just try it for a month, like during, during the summer when I'm on vacation? So I did that and it was just, um, it was really cool because it was actually really easy to do. And I noticed like, I never went back on day 31 because I still had vegetarian food in the house. And so I kept eating that way for a while. And I know six months had passed and I was still eating a vegetarian. And I thought, well, I guess I'm a vegetarian. Um, and I, you know, I, I felt sharper mentally um, just a little bit. It wasn't a huge increase, but that, that got me started and it inspired me to, um, you know, three and a half years later to go vegan. And now, I, and I did that with a 30 day trial as well. Um, and I liked it a lot. I just felt much more energy. I was doing martial arts at the time and it really increased my sparring endurance. This time it was not a, a, a little increase. You really... This time it was a much bigger increase. Okay. Um, and then I've used that to spawn all kinds of other 30-day trials. I've gone raw for 30 days, you know, 100% eating raw foods for 30 days at a time or eating raw for six months at a time. You don't have to do just 30 days. And, and uh, now I've been vegan for 20 years and that has made like a huge difference. People ask me, how do you write so much? And it's because of like, eating lighter foods so you have more energy for your mind and focus so you're not spending all your energy on digestion breaking down heavy foods so then it's it's great for focus it's um, you know great for mental endurance being able to write for four or five hours at a time without taking a break concentrating on just one article idea you know all the way through that was you know if I had just um, one change to make it would be going vegetarian and vegan like if I could throw out everything else I did in my life, you know, even entrepreneurship, I would throw that out. Really? I would just keep that one thing because that, wow. that gave me more benefits than anything else. Just, just eating, you know, it's really simple to do in, in a way. I mean, just eating lighter on the food chain. Um, and it just, it gave, me much, it gave me everything else I wanted in life, really. It came from that, so. Wow. So I hope it's inspired you to do like tests because yeah, you really like. I'm really into testing. I'm not here to like preach any particular change to anybody. Uh, but I am really into testing, so try it for yourself. How many tests did you, do you do during a year? Do you do 12 or Dozens. like one a month? Oh, a year? Um, it depends. I also do some really strange experiments. Um, so sometimes I'm not doing any trials at all. Uh, other times I'll do longer trials. Like this, this year, one of, my, one of my goals is to go all of the whole year without any caffeine. So no, no uh, coffee, no black tea, no green tea, no white tea. Um, and also no, oh, no tea, no chocolate, no, oh. sti no stimulants whatsoever mm. um, the whole year. Wow. So I guess if I'm saying that on camera now, I'm committed to it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because it's the beginning of the year. So yep. yeah, wow. So how do you, f when you have challenges like that, how do you fight against the struggle? You know, the, the, the urge to, to, to eat chocolate or to drink coffee or... You know, after you've gone a, a while on it, you know, it's, it's not that difficult. Okay. So last year I would have coffee occasionally. Um, sometimes a lot, especially when I would go to Europe because they have such good espresso there. Yeah. When I went to Italy, I was having espresso every day because <laughs> uh, it's really good. Or when I would go to France, you know, I'd have it there. Um, and, and, you know, I'd, I'd get hooked on it and I'd get addicted to it. And I noticed it would make my thoughts more scrambled. I wouldn't be as clear, as focused. So then I'd 
I'd make a bigger commitment. Like I'd go, okay, I'm doing a month with no caffeine at all. And then I'd, you know, after like a week or two, once I got past the caffeine hangover, I'd be done with it. And I wouldn't even want it anymore. I wouldn't crave it anymore. And then I'd notice how much more relaxed my mind was. It was, you know, calm instead of like crazy all over the place. Um, you know, with com coming up with constant ideas and just cluttering my mind with all this fluff. And without, ca without caffeine at all, it's like, ah, oh, it's nice and calm. I can just focus more easily on one thought at a time. So Tim Ferriss just released a new book, Tools of Titans. Mm -hmm. and he, I've heard of it, I haven't read it. Yeah, I, I began to read it and it's, it's like a lot of interviews from his podcast, you know. And he all, also gives like a few in very interesting questions to, to ask people. So I borrow a few of the questions he share in his book for you. Okay. So the first one is, when you, see, when you think of the word successful, the word successful, uh, who is the first person who comes to your mind and why? Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci is what oh. comes to mind okay why um, because he was successful in so many different fields because he he mastered so many different arts i mean he was an artist he was designing military technology um he was you know learning about early aviation yeah <laughs> um, very early yeah um, <laughs> um mathematics you know uh, uh, spirit, various sciences he was getting into so i like that model um because you know, a lot of people in the world tell you you have to niche down and, and go to just, you know, one narrow focus and that and you have to be an expert of that. Mm. But I've actually found that very disheartening because when I was going to start my blog in 2004, I realized if I pick any one narrow focus like time management, I'm going to be bored with that in a year or two or maybe five years if I can stretch it. Mm. And then it'll just be heartless work to maintain that empire or whatever I built around it. So I just thought, I don't want to do that. Um, I have so many different interests. I really want to explore life and I don't want to get to the end of life and look back and think about all the things I missed out on because my focus was too narrow. So I, I like doing deep dives temporarily and then I like to resurface, look at the big picture of life and maybe pick a whole new direction. And you have a new skills. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't want to just be like, just one guy who does only one thing, you know, really well. I want to do a lot of things um, and do them at a significant amount of depth. So uh, I call that the mile wide, mile wide, mile deep strategy. And okay. you know, people yeah. say you have to go a mile wide, or, or okay. So All if this is for French, a kilometer wide yeah. and a <laughs> centimeter deep. <laughs> um, All the reverse. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, or you have to go, you know, the opposite of that. And so to do that, you have like. Yeah, period of time when you focus deeply on a subject, and then when you're done, you, you go on something else. Like uh, when, when we met in, in Los Angeles a few months ago, you, you told me you were really into uh, typography for a time, like uh, two months maybe, yeah. and, and you wrote a lot of articles about that in your blog. But now, now you don't read anymore about this and... Uh... That deep dive was just a couple of days, yeah, oh, just really? about two days to learn typography. Really? Yeah. Because there's a lot of good websites where you'll learn the basics really quickly. And I have to say, uh, you on your blog you have pretty good fonts, and uh, we we exchanged a few emails. And I, I ask you, what is the font you're using? Because I don't know, it's so smooth, you know, so smooth. It's like uh, it, it's it's pleasurable to read your emails because it's different than uh, the font of everyone else. I'm um, exchanges email with, you know. Oh, okay. So, yeah, well, the one I use on my website is a font called Charter. The one I um, the one I use in email is just one of the built-in um, fonts that Gmail lets you use. I pick Garamond for that because it only gives you a handful of choices, and so I picked the one that was closest to the one on my website. Okay. Um, if I could use Charter in an email easily, I could. It would work. I'd have to copy something from my blog, paste it into an email, and then edit the text, and it would continue using Charter. I think for that. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, it's you know, it's close enough. But so Leonard was like, Leonardo Vinci was like a, a genius in a lot of fields and he had an impact in a lot of fields. Also in some fields, his, his impact didn't last, like a, a early aviation, it was not really, you know, don't you think that's also it yeah, can Modeling be... a bird didn't quite work for airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> don't you think it can also like be like dispersion? to do what, what he did. And do you think it's possible to have a, a, an impact in a lot of fields today? Because it's like five centuries later on, we have way more knowledge in every field than I, before. I, I think, you know, for me, I originally made the decision just for lifestyle reasons, but I found it beneficial. And one of the things I noticed is that people get a very narrow focus in a certain field and they only use, you know, let's say you're running a business in a certain field. You'll, you'll find that Everybody in that field uses the same marketing techniques, like lawyers. They all tend to market themselves the same way. And then you go to a different field, um, like you know, online 
marketing, you know, online marketers marketing themselves. They do things very differently than lawyers do. Yeah. And then you go to a totally different field, like um, you know, restaurateurs, and you'll find that they market their businesses totally differently. And so if, if you just look at it from a marketing perspective, if you hop around different fields and do deep dives into different areas, you're going to learn so many different techniques for marketing your own business. So, and, and that's very true. Like, you know, you also learn um, different techniques that can help you grow faster by adapting ideas. Like, since I used to be a, a computer programmer and worked as a game developer, I use ideas from game development to, um, to enhance my current business or my lifestyle. Like the 30-day trial idea I got from software development. Um, taking an algorithmic approach, you know, like a step-by-step, -step, you know, what's the process approach to personal development or to setting my goals. I use a very methodical approach to goal achievement a lot of the time. That I got from writing computer programs. Um, you know, it, it, there's, there's so many things you can transplant from one field to another that will make you look like a genius because nobody else is doing that. Right. And, and because I explore so many different fields, I notice things in the blogosphere, you know, in, in blogging that peop, everybody says, okay, here's the rules, you have to do this. And I tend to find better results by breaking the rules. As soon as I see somebody saying, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to focus on, I realize their, their focus is being too narrow and they're missing a lot of the big picture that they would get if they, saw, if they explored different fields. Um, for instance, there's a huge emphasis on search engine optimization, yeah. which is something I completely ignore to a large extent. And I've been ignoring that all along, and yet my website does really well in search engines. Very well, yeah. And you know, people are constantly telling me they're searching on something and they find my website. I've had old, old, you know, old friends look me up because they found my website from you know, various searches. And the, uh, the, the thing there is, though, is that I see a, a bigger picture because I've explored other fields, and so I, kn I know that this, this overemphasis on search engine optimization is a dead end because you're just, it's all tactic based and it's all technique based and it's not going to last because Google's going to get smarter and smarter and smarter and I thought this is just, you know, this is not the way to go. So I focused on, instead of SEO, I call it HBO, human visitor optimization. <laughs> I decided I'm gonna write my articles for human beings, not for computers and I thought about what's the long term here and I, I thought what I wanna do is I really wanna connect with people on a human level, on an emotional level, not come across as fake or phony or stuff all kinds of artificial keywords in my articles just to get a ranking uh, that's only gonna last for a certain amount of time. Instead, like really impact people. And so I focused, you know, instead on trying to trick technology into doing my bidding for me, it's like really help people, you know, really um, focus on deepening my sense of caring, uh, deepening my sense of compassion when I write really getting um, into the mindset of the people I'm writing for and what their problems are and going deep on the human side versus going shallow, you know, semi-deep on the technology side in a way that's going to be very temporary. And the cool thing is like people are still, you know, somebody um, in, in Launch Club actually just posted one of my articles in the group that they found by doing an organic search on Google and it was an article I wrote in 2006. Oh. You know, and yeah, and then people are discussing the article. So I'm like, okay, an article I wrote 10 years ago, people are still finding it in search engines. Yeah. And you know, what, what ri ri rises you up in a search engine? It's, uh, a search engine is just another type of referral. Um, when enough people start referring you know, with, through social media, through linking to your articles from their blog, um, that causes you to get a higher page rank and, and rise up in, in Google. So I focus on you know, getting the, the humans to refer, not the machines. And if the humans refer, the machines pick up on that, <laughs> and then they refer, if that makes sense. Yeah, but so I think if you try to bypass the human element and go straight to the machine element, you're, you're missing something really important there. Yeah. And then when people get to your website, they're like, oh, this is just a fluff piece, and they click off because they don't feel engaged. Yeah, so to summary what you say is like, we should like uh, everyone should like have a scientific approach to their life by doing experiments, and you do this. You fuel this by your curiosity. You you want to explore different areas and just learn the basic stuff that everybody is using in a field, but not in another. And just by bringing a common stuff uh, in a field in, the, in another field that nobody knows about it, it's like you're genius. Exactly. You look like a genius, but you're just using like basic stuff that nobody heard in this particular field. Yeah. And so when you mix uh, curiosity with uh, a good uh, approach, which is the experiment, so you, you're really open-minded and you're just looking at the results you get, you can like get more skills and more creativity than most people without too much work. So it can be very fun. 
what, what, what people are missing is they look at the opportunity cost of like switching fields, but I'm not suggesting you have to switch fields. I'm suggesting you explore deeply in a lot of different fields, and you'll find that all those things enhance each other, that they actually make you a better expert in each thing that you explored. Because you see the interrelations. But it's not about doing a shallow exploration of each thing. It's actually about going to significant depth in each area. So you're not just going to dabble endlessly and just like do things for a couple days here, a couple days there. It's like go really deep into more than one thing. So for example, you, you, you just said like uh, you studied for a few days typography. Do you think it was a deep dive or not? That was a, a very temporary short deep dive, okay. but it was a very functional one. I needed to you know, look at better fonts for my website. So that included looking at 600 different fonts before I picked which one 600. I wanted. 600? Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, I went through like every Google font, you know, and then I ended up picking something that wasn't even in the Google fonts. Um, All right. And uh, you know, looking at even more, even more to try to find something that I felt looked good. And you know, things I learned about typography, you know, like I could, I could, I could see how they impacted um, or, or related to other fields. And I could use knowledge in one field to enhance my knowledge in another field. Yeah. See, when we learn, you know, if you if you study the brain, and I've studied a lot of neuroscience. The way the brain works is it's always building um, connections with what we already have. And so when you learn, in, learn new knowledge, it has to find something to connect it to. So if you create a broad base of things that your brain can connect new knowledge to, then it has a, uh, an easier time classifying things. You know, when you, when you study something new like topography, I was like, how do I hang this? You know, like, what is this? What do, this seems like this whole field hanging out there by itself. But I very quickly was able to connect it with something else that I already understood. Um, like, Typography is actually a form of self-expression. And I understand self-expression really well because I do that as a speaker and as a writer. And so the way I picked the fonts is I thought, what is the message I'm trying to deliver? And I realized typography is a, it communicates something. You know, if you do use a, a really flowery font, that might be appropriate for a wedding invitation, but it may not be appropriate for, you know, reading technical material. Sure. <laughs> so, so whatever I picked, I thought, this is, this is communication. So I wanted to, I, I wanted to pick a font that aligns with the message I want to put out. I want something that's accessible, you know, fairly easy to read, but when you look at it closely, there's some depth to it. It's, um, and so you probably won't notice this, but if you look at some of the fonts on my website, you'll notice they have slight embellishments around like the edges, like the, you know, certain letters will have like these little um, curved parts or these little um, triangle shaped parts. And it's not something you'll notice at first glance, but you only notice it when you look deeper. And so there's actually a message behind the typography I chose, and that everything was chosen, every font on every, every element of the site was chosen very deliberately. And it's to enhance the message. And it's just like you know, any, kind of, um, any kind of communication. But I didn't realize it was a form of communication. I thought it's just something, you know, oh, you pick it to look nice, right? Yeah. And so when I understood it, then I could connect yeah. my study of typography to things I already knew, yeah. like self-expression. And then I go, ah, instantly, I get it. Um, you know, another example was I, ex I explored fashion many years ago. It's not something I got terribly into, but in 2009, I did a deep dive into fashion. I had a friend that was in interested in it. And we went on a late Las Vegas strip, and we went shopping, and he was showing me all these different things. And I bought like a $200 shirt, you know, and, and was trying this on. And I was like, okay, I see what's, you know, I, I understand a little bit more about this. And typography is much like fashion. You know, so boom, two things, very different fields, but, but now you can connect the dots. Yeah. And now, you can use, now I could use all my knowledge that I understood from doing a deep dive into fashion, I could instantly transfer it over to typography. It is self-expression. Mm. You know, and what I understood about picking clothes that I liked and that would express myself, um, I, I like that. Like I, like, I like clothing that it looks plain and simple um, at, at, and when you look at it from far away, but when you get close, you realize there's a pattern to it. Like this might look like a plain solid color shirt, but it actually has texture to it. It's got lines going across mm. it that are slightly different colors. Right. You know, there's, a, there's like something a little bit different about it. Um, and that's the kind of thing I like to express because that's how I feel. I like being accessible, but when you get to know me, you realize there's a lot of depth. And that's how I like to get to know people. It's like, I like to have a very friendly connection, but go deep quickly. And so it's, it's all communication. But you see how everything like from all these different fields that you wouldn't even think you could connect, it does connect? Yeah. 
I had a lot of other questions from team, but since we are running out of time, there is a topic I, I really want to talk about. It's open relationship. Okay. Because you shared a lot about this like a few years ago. You don't do it too much anymore. So and I, th I think you have like a lot of things to say about this. But first, are you still in open relationship today? Yep, for, yep. for seven years. Seven years. Yep. In fact, our seven year anniversary is in two days. Wow. Yeah. Congrats. <laughs> seven years since we first got together. Wow. So just and we're not we're not married though. So how, how would you define an open relationship? You know, everyone everyone defines it differently. Yeah. Um, we tend to be monogamous when we're together, but if we're in other you know other cities or we travel a lot, mm -hmm. um, then it's like it's okay if you want to connect or play with somebody else. Uh -huh. um, or we'll have threesomes together. We've done that many times. Um, so we even did. Uh, we even went to an orgy recently. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For, first time. I'm not really an orgy kind of guy, but it was kind of fun to just have that experience for the first time and see what it was like. And yeah, here in Las Vegas? Yeah, here in Las Vegas. Right. I don't think either of us were all that into it, but it was like, okay. You know. Let's explore. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so okay. So it means you, when you're together, you're together, you do threesomes, and sometimes you go, you have adventures when you go abroad and you're not together. Do, do you share this or do you, you don't talk yeah. too much? Yeah. No, we, sh we, we share. Um, sure? But there's an unusual element to our, to our relationship and that yeah. we're, we're not just in an open relationship, we're also in, an, in a long distance relationship. So I'm American Maybe, yeah. and she, Rochelle, is Canadian. Yeah, and she and lives she, in? And she lives, she'll stay here with me about six months out of the year, which is about the legal limit. Yeah. And uh, so we don't, we don't break the law or anything like that. Uh, but since we're not married, you know, we can't be in each other's countries for too long. So I can sometimes go visit her in Canada or more often uh, we'll go travel together somewhere. Like um, last year, we went to spend a few weeks in Mexico, we went to Costa Rica, we went to London, went to Rome, and we also spent some time in Canada together. Wow. So we'll, tr we'll travel to usually a few countries each year. Uh, we've been to France a couple of times, just Paris and, Ver and Versailles. Okay, Versailles, yeah, <laughs> which is very close. So you, you see each other like six months a year or more with all the travels? And, uh... um, usually more, usually about seven, eight months a year, I'd have to say. Okay, so still, that's like a few months. But we'll spend four or five months apart each year. Sometimes for you know pretty long stretches. It could just be for a few weeks apart, but it might be for two or three months apart. So, so I think the longest we've done is maybe just over three months. So, so do, you, do, do you share spontaneously the adventures you have with other people? Or is like sometimes you ask, so what, who are you into right now? Yeah, it's kind of like just spontaneously. Um, I tend to be pretty opportunistic and pretty lazy. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, you know, I don't tend to just go out of my way to try to create a new connection. Um, but sometimes things just happen. You know, yeah. like when I, it often happens when I'm traveling by myself then you know i might have a nice playful connection with somebody now that could it, it's usually just really short term so that could be just like for a few days up to you know at the most was maybe like three weeks or so three weeks yeah, yeah. of course when you're traveling it's like a, okay but this is another area where i you know uh, you know neither of us are the jealous types this is another area where i feel like this doing this other exploration it okay. actually enhances your primary relationship because it gives you more of a sense of variety and when you know, when we're out of town or when I've connected with somebody else and then I go back to Rochelle, it reminds me what I appreciate about her and I feel much more gratitude. It's like our relationship doesn't get stale in that sense. Um, and so you were not jealous at all in the first place. No. So you don't have to deal with it because it's a, it's a big problem for a lot of people. No, in fact, I'm like trying to push her to connect more with other guys. I'm like, you know, you haven't connected, you know, yeah. you're not doing enough in that area. It's like go out and connect more with other guys. And why you, do you feel that she needs more? I think it's good for us. I think it's good for the variety, you know? And anything she learns from connecting with another guy, it's like now she can bring that to our relationship and enhance it. Mm. Interesting. So because that's, that's how I feel when I connect with somebody else. It's like, it reminds me of what I really appreciate about Rochelle. And anything I really liked about that short-term connection, then I can bring that into our relationship. You know, like what went so well? Why did it go well? Like you learn something from every every person. So a lot of people would ask, how do, what if you want child with this type of relationship? What if you want children? Um, then that's going to be more complicated. Yeah, because you already have two children yeah. from a previous uh, marriage. Yeah, yeah so it's, you don't want them more. I don't. I don't want any more kids right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something to consider. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I mean. You know, it's a lifestyle choice. It's not something I think is right for everyone. Um, so you didn't feel it challenging at all? 
this kind of friction shit. Challenging? Yeah. No, it feels totally normal, totally natural to me. Um, getting into it can be challenging, you know, because there's a lot of limiting beliefs to unlock. But once you're in it, you know, after you've been in it for seven years, it's just normal. It's like breathing. You know, it's it's you. you then you look at other people's relationship and you see, well, okay, well they've got their relationships in a box. You know, it's um, what one person calls uh, fenced relationships. Yeah, um, fenced. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the book Sex Sex 3.0 talks about that. Sex 3.0. Yeah. yeah, Sex 3.0. Okay. Reference. Talks about it, so using open and closed relationships. It, it calls them uh, fenced and unfenced. So like you have a fence around it. And with unfenced, it means there's no fence. So you can walk out anywhere and connect with anybody, anybody else. Yeah. I think it's such an interesting topic because we are, first, it's very interesting to experiment by yourself. And it's also something that is so shaped by society. Society is defining how you should behave in your relationship with, you know, people you love. And when you realize Society tells you something, but like everything it tells you, you can challenge it and try something else. Because when you are between adults and you just you agree on something, you're just limited by your imagination and the comfort zone of other people. So it's, it begins begins to be a, a whole new playground, and you can experiment a lot with that. You also you also find out more about what you like while you're still in a relationship. So you can explore your current relationship and also just learn more things you like, like more patterns. Uh, you don't have to like put your personal growth in your relationship area on hold or put it in a box yeah. and limit yourself. You get to keep exploring. Yeah. Um, like there's some things that surprised me. Like I'm actually really into women um, that have some kind of French in their background. Yeah. As, as funny as that sounds, yeah. Uh, Rochelle is French Canadian. Yeah. But many of the women I've had the best connections with, they've been, you know, like partly French, like French some. I think the universe is sending you the sign that you should learn French. Maybe. Steve, right? <laughs> Maybe the next interview will be in French. <laughs> Let's hope for that. <laughs> you want to do a deep dive in French? I thought about it. <laughs> I did take three years of French in high school, yeah. uh, but I had a, a teacher who was Basque. And so he taught us Basque? For, yeah, for the first two years. Okay. And so he, apparently we learned this weird, like, weird accent when we were trying to learn French. Oh, okay. And then the... The third year, we had uh, a woman who had actually been to France for, for a while, lived there for a while, and she was having to correct all our accents. All right. But, but when I don't speak it, I just for, I forget it. I can actually read French fairly decently, wow. but speaking it and pronouncing it, it's really difficult. All right. Understanding the spoken word, I can understand a little bit of it. I'll pick up you know, a few words here and there. Like quelque chose, I know that word. Quelque chose. <laughs> Great. So uh, to finish this interview, um, I think a lot of people would be interested in uh, trying, exploring open relationship. But at the beginning, it's hard for them to meet other people who are open to this because it's still like it's not very mainstream, right? Uh, how, uh, did you find how to connect with women who were open to this? Not at all. No, no. How come? Yeah. It's because you live in Las Vegas, and you know, it's like I think. No, but I've actually had hardly any connections with people locally. It's almost always when I'm traveling. Interesting. Yeah, it's almost always when I'm traveling or it's somebody else traveling here. Um, but I'm not really into the, the local scene here um, in terms of like open relationships. I, I it will bring the last question, but first, so how, how come you, you connected so easily with... Uh... I, I feel like a lot of it had to do with just aligning my beliefs and getting past the fear and the shame and the, you know, the, like what, how will other people judge me. So I worked on that first, and when I did that, it just unlocked everything. And I realized people think that the block is that it's something external, that there's nobody out there that will be into this, but really the block is, I think, a lot more internal than we realize, that we're blocking ourselves because we're not comfortable with it on some level. So I gradually did things to make myself comfortable with it. Um, I, I blogged about it was one. Yeah. So I put myself out there, and I, you know, when I had a Twitter account, I don't have a Twitter account anymore, There is somebody impersonating me on Twitter now, but I don't have an account. <laughs> um, so I haven't had an account since 2014. But when I did, I had around 30,000 um, plus Twitter followers. And I practiced you know, sharing things with them. Like I wrote, I heart, heart, heart threesomes. And I realized what happened is when I got to the point where I was no longer ashamed of it and I was no longer worried about what people thought, I could do anything. 
And, and people could, would come to you saying, oh, great. Uh, like when I wrote, I heart, heart, heart threesome. So I love threesomes. And put that on Facebook to 30,000 people. I didn't get a single negative piece of feedback. Really? Yeah, I got people writing back like, oh, me too, or good for you, or you know, <laughs> things like that. And I realized like when you have no resistance to something, the world stops resisting bringing it to you. But when you resist it, people pick up on that. Like when I, and, and now I see it from the opposite perspective, because when I'm into an open relationship and I see somebody who might want to connect in that area, but they're not really congruent with it yet, I can feel the resistance in them. I can see it. And I wouldn't want to introduce them to that world. And I realized that's what people were doing with me. And, I, and as soon as I opened myself up and became comfortable with it, people I already knew told me, oh yeah, you know, I've been in an open relationship for years. You know, like famous authors, speakers that I knew, they would come and tell me by private email. I, well, I won't say who it is, <laughs> uh, but these, I said, you were, you know, you're that way? And they said, yeah. And I said, I said why didn't you tell me? He said, because I didn't think you'd be cool about it. And I thought, oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. And so as soon as I put myself out there as a person who's comfortable with it and is curious about it, and that's, that's especially important. It's like, be a good student say, I want to learn this. Say, I like this idea, I'm open to it, I really want to learn. And then it was just like the floodgates poured in. So many people from that community just emailed me and they're saying, read this book, read this book. Um, you, know, uh, you know, here's how you can find people. Here's how you can find partners. They just told me. Awesome. And it was actually really easy. And so much of it is just getting the comfort and putting yourself out there. And then, then you can just in make invitations and things will show up. Like when Rochelle and I decided we want to have our first threesome, uh, this was back in 2010. We, we didn't know how to do this, so we just, I think I posted on my Facebook page that we were interested in having our first threesome. Wow. And somebody from my Facebook followers said, oh, I'm coming to Vegas in a few weeks, I'll have a threesome with you guys. So somebody I never even met, you know, so she, <laughs> He's crazy. yeah, so she comes over to my house and we have a threesome together. And I was like, oh, wow, that was awesome. It was like, <laughs> you just have to have Yeah, it was, it was like, that was, that's all it took. And once that happened, it's then like, you know, then it would almost just happen spontaneously sometimes. Or it'd just be like, you could kind of tell, like, you'd, you'd pick up this radar, like you think, I bet you she would love to have a threesome with us. And then you would ask her and she's like, yeah, okay, why not? You know, it's, it, and yeah. you're realizing it's, it's that easy, like you could just ask and somebody might say yes. Um, I'm trying to remember if we even asked anybody that ever said no, or it's like, you just get, a, maybe, I, I, don't re I don't recall, but you just get kind of fine-tuned to it and you, you kind of know when the yes is going to happen. It's just, it's like a calibration process. And it's like you, you get that sense, but you don't even notice that kind of thing beforehand because you're, you're repelling people and not even realizing you're doing that. Wow, awesome. So to finish on a lighter touch, I was always intrigued to see someone, because you were, you're someone with really high integrity and high transparency, as you can, we can see. So why, why are you living in the city that is, <laughs> I mean, Las Vegas. <laughs> the surname of Las Vegas is Sin City. So I don't know, for me, it was always, always a mismatch somewhere. I, I, I get asked that a lot. Yeah. People, people, other, some people say like, Steve, you, I know you're kind of a spiritual guy too. Why would you want to live in a city like this? You know, it seems like the total opposite of your message. Yeah, right. And I say, no, it's completely aligned with my message. Huh. I said, Las Vegas is all about freedom and possibility. I mean, here we've built this oasis in the desert. Um, to me, the, I find that inspiring. You know, we have we have our own Eiffel Tower here. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> it's about you know, it's like half scale, but it's, yeah. you know, I've, I've been to, I've been to the top of both, the one in Paris and the one here in Las Vegas. Oh. And uh, it's you know, the, uh, what I love about Las Vegas most is that it's a very non-judgmental place to live. Mm. And so I can do all these crazy lifestyle experiments. I can constantly reinvent myself um, and not feel a lot of social pressure to be a certain way. This is a city where a lot of people come to to reinvent themselves. You know, a lot of people come here and start new lives. And I, you know, I found that really fascinating. I really got caught up in the energy of that place. I'm not into the drinking or the gambling or the staying up all night, you know, going to the casinos. That's not my scene. But um, I love the, the sense of freedom and, and possibility that this city has. Awesome. And, uh, you know, that we built this oasis in the desert. It tells yeah. me like, hey, if we can do this, you know, we built this, these huge structures. We have a pyramid. We've got, we've got our own Statue of Liberty. <laughs> we've got uh, a roller coaster in the casino. We've got Venetian canals. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like every, everything. We like have ancient Rome with Caesar's Palace. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like it's all here. We, you know, we brought it all to the, you know, to what was once a barren wasteland. And I thought, if you know, if we can do that, that's, that's wonderful. And to, so to me, Las Vegas is one of the most spiritual cities on earth. 
because it gives you total freedom to explore who you are as a human being without, without shoving you too much in any one direction. You know, and all the temptation is there. Any direction you want to go, you want to drink, gamble, stay up late at night, sleep with prostitutes, you know, it's like, people, people aren't going to judge you for that. So you want to explore anything, it's fine. And that I, that I love. So I've, I've lived here for, um, actually this month is uh, 13 years. 13. Yeah. And you love it. Yeah. Because now you, you could live anywhere. I could. I still, I still like the city. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay, wow. So thank you very much for this very deep interview. So uh, if you want to connect with Steve, you can go on his website, stevepalvina.com. There is also, if you are not in English, uh, the French translation that I do, uh, Devenez Meilleur. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you have a specific message you want to share with the French world, maybe? How do you say live consciously in French? Uh, vivez consciemment. Vivez consciemment. Consciemment, yeah. Consciemment. All right, thank you Steve. Uh, donc comme d'habitude, j'ai besoin de votre feedback. Si vous avez aimé cette vidéo, si vous pensez que Steve il a partagé des trucs vraiment géniaux, bien cliquez sur j'aime juste en dessous, partagez la vidéo éventuellement en l'envoyant à la personne à laquelle vous pensez. Cliquez sur la petite vignette qui va apparaître pour aller sur le site, le site de Steve. Je vous ai mis aussi la, la version française donc dans les références ici. Puis n'oubliez pas aussi de vous abonner à la chaîne en cliquant sur le bouton qui va bien. Merci d'avoir regardé cette vidéo. À demain pour la prochaine. En attendant, n'oubliez pas, soyez rebelles, soyez intelligents, faites partie des gens qui se bougent et thank you Steve. Au revoir.